Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. So I just wanted to do a little intro to this video because it's a bit different to the videos I normally do. In fact, this was my very first interview with someone else on my channel. So towards the end of the last year, I went to London and I had the opportunity to interview Matt Dowling from the Freelancer Club. I'm gonna leave links to the Freelancer Club in the description. I really recommend checking out their site after you watch the video. As you can see from this video, Matt is insanely knowledgeable on the freelancer industry and he has a lot of really interesting observations. Today's video is quite long. I recommend treating it more like a podcast, so get on with other things, have it on in the background. Some of the things we touched on in this video are really important, so I really hope you enjoy listening to this interview. Let me know what you think of it in the comments. Let me know if you'd like me to make more videos like this, talking with industry professionals, because I would really love to. I think, although it's a really scary experience for me, it's also so um, just so beneficial to meet people like this and yeah it gives me a bit of hope for the future of this industry so I hope you enjoy this video let's get into it Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Holly Exley and I'm an illustrator. I am conducting my first interview on my channel with Matt Dowling who is the co-founder of the Freelancer Club. Hi, Hi. how are you doing? Good, how are you? Very well. Thank you for Good. having me. Thank you for meeting up with me. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Could you explain a little bit about the Freelancer Club for people that might not have heard of it before? Yeah, sure. The club was initially set up to help support creative freelancers. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be a photographer many, many years ago and found there wasn't a huge amount of support in terms of business or even knowledge sharing as to how to be a freelancer. The longer I got into it, the more I realized that I was figuring a lot of things out for myself made a huge amount of mistakes, was at the sharp end of a very large invoice that wasn't paid to me, mm. which left me very broke mm. and even emotionally quite shaken by the whole experience. Mm. That was sort of the day I think where the, the seed was planted to say, okay, I want to try and do something about this. I want to make sure this doesn't happen to other people. So Freelancer Club started in my mind at that point and a couple of years later it was realized. Okay. So we're a pretty big network now. We have mm -hmm. 40,000 members. We're predominantly in the UK. We connect freelancers with clients who need freelancers and we provide uh, events, resources and support. Did you ever get that money back? Because no. I, I was reading about that on your website. It was quite a huge sum, wasn't it? Yeah, it was 11 grand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't. Um, with the last 200, 300 pounds I had, I spent it on a lawyer. He did everything he could, but how it works is you get put on a credit list and if the company uh, doesn't have the funds to pay you, you don't get paid. They were very tactical. They continued to uh, engage me for my services to, to photograph their stock for months knowing they were going out of business. And so their idea was to try and get as much stock photographed and sold before they pulled the plug on everybody. And there's no way of you knowing what's going on behind the scenes, so... No way, yeah. no. And the really tricky part in that instance was where I shot was a separate studio to the head office. Mm -hmm. So I'd never met anybody in the head office. I had no engagement with them. That was a sort of four or five month pursuit mm -hmm. just to find out that they had gone bankrupt and wow. yeah, it was a tricky time. <laughs> it's a nightmare for most freelancers. Yeah, it was, wow. it was a really tough time. Well, I'm glad you made turn it into something positive, the Freelancer Club. We're going to talk about the No Free Work campaign today. So if you could explain a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. So the campaign was very much born of, of the story I've just mentioned and how so many people are getting asked to work for free and typically they're getting asked to work for exposure, for experience or sometimes freelancers are doing professional work for the prestige if they really like a brand and they feel honoured to work for that brand. Mm. Uh, it's typically happening in the creative industries um, or any industry that is aspirational so music, uh, film and TV, fashion, uh, sport, surprisingly, oh, is wow. uh, it's really rife. Mm. So the definition of unpaid work for us is when a company that is um, profitable or that, even if it's not, if it engages or asks a, photo a photographer freelancer uh, to work for uh, no monetary uh, gain. Mm. So that might mean all the reasons I touched on, experience, um, for exposure in, in a publication. Mm. Um, it's not to be mistaken for a collaboration whereby freelancers can come together and produce work for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, nor is it to be mistaken for um, 
voluntary work, mm. uh, which is different, or work experience, which often takes place whilst in education and there's four credits. So I was going to ask about that. A lot of people do say, I won't do any free work unless it's for a charity or a cause that I believe in. What's your stance on that? It's a really tricky one. Mm. It's probably the toughest one that we deal with. Thank yeah. you for starting with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, our line with this is to say, if you believe in the cause, mm. um, then it's up to you if you want to give up your time. However, we would always suggest speaking with the charity to first of all find out if they are a charity. Yeah. Because, and this is not necessarily a fraudulent approach, but we find a lot of companies are classifying their event as a charitable event, mm. but they're actually not a registered charity. So mm. they should have a charity number. You should be able to look that up quite easily. Yeah. The second thing to ask is to find out if everyone else is getting paid. Often in charities, there is a business behind it where people almost always take a wage. Yeah. And so we've found a lot that it's less about this tag of we're a charity, won't you come and do it because you believe in this? Mm. And it's more about, well, it's just photography or it's just video or you're just a makeup artist or it's just a piece of art, it's an illustration. Mm. And for some reason, our craft is not as valued as someone who pours pints or someone who uh, stands guard at a door. Yeah. And it feels to me as if it's an attitude issue mm. as much as an exploitative issue. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it's because we tend to start these occupations because we love them and because they're a hobby first and then we pursue them until they become a profession and maybe that's a reason why it's not so valued and people can look down on it. I think so yeah. and I think knowing where that line is mm. so as soon as you it stops being a hobby for you and st it starts to become your career yeah. um, and I think we might get into this later but mm -hmm. you know that, that's when you have to start paying and valuing your work and I think because Art and business has never mixed super well. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. That it's a murky area for mm. us. I, I'd always consider myself an artist. I'm, I'm not mm. money driven in the slightest. And first few years of my career, I found it really hard asking for money or talking about money. Yeah. Um, I found it a bit vulgar, and um, which in business it really shouldn't be. Mm. Uh, I thought it was separate from my art and what I was doing and my passion. And actually that just opened the, the floodgates for people to be able to take advantage. Do you think it's anything to do with the kind of mystery of creating and not really understanding how much work and process goes into learning photography or becoming an illustrator that means that they don't understand the value of how many hours it takes to produce something or learn a skill? Yeah, I think there's an element of that. Mm. If we really take this back and think about how creative we all were as children. Kids are typically very creative mm. and we do hit a point at some stage, well some of us do, uh, where you stop being as creative and you start moving into a different area. I have a feeling that people who are not in the creative industries probably take that for granted and I think they belittle what we do a lot. And to your point in regards to the time it takes, not just how long it takes to learn a skill. Yeah. Um, not everyone is naturally gifted and even if they are, surely that's still valuable. Mm. Um, but even the, the practical uh, preparations, so yeah. conceptualizing an idea, mm. whether that's illustration, video, photography, mm. a lot of things need to be prepared. Um, the execution of the, the job itself, the shoot itself, and the post-production. Mm. Um, so a lot of what our members are doing uh, our clients have no idea. It's yeah. four or five thousand photographs that they might have to whittle down to two or three. Mm -hmm. That could be five or six hours. Clients could certainly educate themselves a little more in terms of what's involved. I don't think technology's helped hugely, whereby mm -hmm. the value of a photo is diminishing mm -hmm. year on year. And that's the same for illustration. We've got stock illustration now that you can just go and buy for 10 quid, 50 quid or something. That's what, it. Yeah. So if you think about even stock as a a solution. It's important, I think, for us not to fight that progress, if you mm -hmm. like, or fight that option that's within our sector. Yeah. Um, it's it's business and it's the market and mm -hmm. it's how it's how it plays out. It's what we do to combat it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're always pivoting and changing. We're always looking for new angles to find work. Yeah. Um, where one door closes, I think another opens and. Um, Stock has definitely shut down a lot of avenues for people. Mm. Um, now one may o only illustrate based on uh, a specific request yeah. if that stock isn't available. Yeah. And if I'm a small business and budgets are tight, it's a bit of a no-brainer. I'm going to take the stock if I find something that's perfect. Yeah. 
Um, so I think illustrators, photographers, all of us need to be aware of it mm. um, and perhaps look to adapt. Since embarking on the No Free Work campaign, what have been your findings in the different industries? Have you found that one industry in the freelance sector suffers the most from taking on free work? It's fairly evenly spread across mm -hmm. the board. So what we did about two years ago, a little less than that, is we put out a survey. The survey touched on everything from have you ever accepted unpaid work? Why did you do it? Why did you accept it? Uh, what were the consequences? Mm -hmm. And what we were looking to find out was does unpaid work benefit you as a freelancer. We wanted to be completely unbiased about it with no prejudice going in. We had over a thousand freelancers typically within fashion, beauty and lifestyle. The results were like shocking and way worse than we thought. Really? Unpaid work is costing each freelancer over five grand a year. We had asked people who had accepted unpaid work up to 15 years ago. The average uh, was around seven years that people were still accepting unpaid work into their really? career. Because initially we thought it was just new people, yeah. um, which isn't the case. Mm -hmm. The gender divide was more or less the same, okay. um, so I don't think it was necessarily uh, tipping towards women as we initially thought, mm. although we did discover that female entrepreneurs and freelancers were typically saying yes to unpaid work more than guys. Okay. Why, we don't know. Yeah. Um, in terms of ages, it was everybody from new student leavers or freelance students right up to, to guys in their 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really a, an epidemic that yeah. has been going on for a long while and it's having a pretty crippling effect on people. The uh, really shocking stuff and the stuff that, that moved us the most when we read it were the consequences of what happened when people accepted unpaid work. Some of the things that uh, came out were uh, homelessness, uh, being unable to pay rent. One story from a makeup artist really affected us w when she told us she couldn't feed her kids because the business that she was trying to run went from being pretty successful a number of years ago into this epidemic of unpaid work and how she found herself fighting against people who were willing to do the same job for free. Mm. It puts it into sharp focus yeah. that, that this is a problem, that is something we need to start talking about and I think we need to start educating people. Mm -hmm. So would you say we're in the middle of the epidemic right now or is it on the rise, free work? So the stats are saying it's, it's neither dropping nor necessarily on the rise. It, it's tricky for us to be incredibly accurate with that without yeah. putting surveys out month on month. Yeah. But certainly from the stream of unpaid work that we receive onto, onto the site and the reports that we get, we're not seeing too much of a fluctuation. Mm. Um, our inkling here is that it's, it starts with the freelancer believing that they have to work for free when they mm. start their career. Something that we talk about a lot at, at universities and when we're lecturing um, to students is understanding their value. The other thing that was disconcerting was a lot of tutors are telling the students that they should work for free. The lines are getting blurred in regards to working during university for credit, which is fine, I guess, if mm. the individual is, is gaining as much or more out of the experience, mm. and it's, they're still in a learning curve. I made a video about competitions and the spec work involved in competitions and found that a lot of universities were encouraging those. But I think there is a line between, if it's a student-only competition, maybe you could enter and it would be a good opportunity, but as soon as you have to be out in the real world and you've got rent to pay, and bills and things like that, maybe spec work shouldn't be encouraged so much. Yeah, and I, I think that's probably an area you'd know a lot more mm. th than I would. Presumably you've put work up for spec in the past, have you? Um, no, I've always okay. avoided these competitions because time is money and I don't want to give my time without payment. I can see why people would think it's a good opportunity because sometimes they're huge brands. I know Coca-Cola did one recently and a lot of big illustrators applied for that. The terms and conditions are really dodgy. So I think it's about educating people to look really closely to what they're giving their work to. Mm. What's your opinion on websites who are promoting competitions, which mm. I've noticed are starting to pop up a lot and it feels like they're using the word competition uh, in terms of language as a replacement uh, to proposals or mm. I don't want to say free work but but I guess only one person out of a thousand is getting that job yeah. which leaves a lot of people um, sitting at home with the work they've produced mm. with no money. That's my worry that competitions will replace actual call outs for work. I feel like it could be approached a different way, the art director could be sourcing artists and approaching them 
and saying, would you like to work with us, rather than gathering lots and lots of free work through these competitions. Mm. just seems very skewed to me and makes the job even more risky because you're, you're dedicating a lot of time to something you might not see results with. It also for me feels like it's putting the portfolio and experience of an individual to one side, mm. which, which is why we build up these portfolios. Yeah. I think particularly as an illustrator, you hone in uh, on your, your style. You build up a portfolio of work and people get to know what your style is and probably what to expect if they hire you. Mm -hmm. um, to ask somebody to produce that work and only accept it if it's right on the money, it seems like we're going about things the wrong way. Mm. Um, and like you said, if everybody started doing that, we would just have people producing work endlessly. Yeah. Some of the excuses I've heard from freelancers in this regard is, well, I've got nothing else to do because I'm starting out or... Mm. And it's this kind of attitude that would unnerve me a little mm. bit as it seems to perpetuate the problem. I did a little survey um, on my YouTube channel just to see what people's reasoning was for doing free work and the biggest reason was to build up their portfolio. They're trying to build their portfolio but at the same time they're giving their work to companies that will then profit off that. That's it. Mm. Yeah, and uh, we get asked that question a lot. Mm. So anytime I give a talk, uh, there's always the question of how do you expect us to enter the industry if, if, if we don't do this? Mm. There's a number of answers that, that we give depending on the industry you're in. Um, I think if we touch on illustration, it'd be great to get you, your thoughts on this, but mm. we've always recommended self projects. So you set yourself a brief, you uh, undertake the brief yourself mm. and you deliver the work for nobody but yourself. Exactly. I've um, said that a few times on my channel. Do okay. the work that you want to be hired for because that's that was my success really. I wanted to be a food illustrator so I commissioned myself. I did a lot of breakfast food illustrations, put them online and then that made me secure my first job. What are some other ways that we can encourage freelancers to value what they do. I think it starts from within. They say that the you become a, a freelancer when you sell your first piece or, or make your first pound. Yeah. Um, I think the you become a freelancer internally and, and mentally long before that. Mm. Um, and I think it's important to know and catch yourself at that stage because the exploitation tends to happen early doors. Yeah. Uh, I talked about how it happens all the way through, but we see a spike in the first few years mm. and knowing to say when to say no is tricky because you think great this is step one into my freelance career I'll work for free for a couple of years sure I did that with an internship so why shouldn't I do it with this mm. both internships and this are wrong don't feel you're gonna miss out when you say no our statistics are absolutely unequivocal mm. you do not benefit by saying yes yeah. um, actually what we found happens with a lot of people is you get a reputation for saying yes to unpaid work. We interviewed one person in particular who said she kept getting inquiries from other companies saying, I've heard you do work for experience. Oh, no. And she became the person who does work for nothing. Mm. Uh, that reputation followed her for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and when she said no, she was deemed to be someone who was ruffling feathers. Even in your mind, if you think, you know what, worst case scenario is I get a bit of experience. Mm -hmm. You're getting a reputation. Mm -hmm. You're really harming your value as a person. You're effectively saying that your uh, work is worth practically nothing in monetary terms, and that you're perpetrating and adding to the problem within the industry at large. Mm -hmm. So it's damaging our industry and effectively it's dropping the rates of everybody else. Yeah. Just that little bit more. One question I had was about social media and your tactic when you hear about companies asking for free work is not to name and shame them and not to call them out on social media but what I'm hearing from illustrators is the only way they feel like they have power or control over situations involving larger companies is to use social media to call out bad conduct what do you think about that I can see the merit I, mm -hmm. I, I can and we made a decision when we started the campaign not to approach it as a witch hunt yeah um, we wanted this campaign to be a very positive campaign mm -hmm. so instead of naming and shaming we approach the company in question yeah. and we say to them this is what's happening most of them don't understand that what they're doing is wrong yeah. um, a lot of the time the people who are uh, putting those jobs out particularly freelance jobs <laughs> it can often be an administrative individual often somebody needs a illustrator a photographer and they'll give that role because they see it as such a throwaway role to a junior in the company yeah large companies are 
the surprising ones in all of this, mm. and they have no excuse that they don't have the budget. It is almost always down to an irresponsible decision. We've found that when you speak to them, they realize that bad press is far more costly to them than paying a fair amount to yeah. uh, an illustrator or, or creative freelancer. Mm. Smaller companies are trickier because they think we don't have the budget to pay, so we're gonna do everything we can to not pay. Yeah. And the last people to get paid, as always, are the creatives. I once got given a business plan and a business proposal from a, a startup company that had a zero budget for content. And I asked, you know, is this a mistake? And, and he said, no, no, we, we'll get this for free. We don't need that. Another guy who, who I spoke to who sort of fights the good fight with us likened this to somebody coming with a business proposal and saying, I'm going to commit fraud with this bit. Um, is that okay? And for the person to say, no, I don't think that's a good way to start a business. Yeah. Um, not paying somebody, it's not necessarily illegal because if you have a contract, it's a contract. Yeah. But to think that that's okay and that's a, a solid business model is diluted. Mm. And something that I feel uh, we've talked about how freelancers need to educate themselves, companies really need to educate themselves. Yeah. Uh, and we all need to get a, a aligned with this, uh, mm. I think, for it to change. So what are some of the main excuses that you hear from companies? So companies typically will say, I, don't, I didn't know, or um, we're going to give them exposure. Fashion magazines will often give a credit, mm. um, which uh, they'll justify as uh, enough payment for the 20, 30, 40 hours plus work that four or five people have mm. produced. Um, You'll see smaller companies say, well, if you come in now, there's a promise of paid work in the future. Yeah. Uh, that's a real doozy. Paid work in the future should be a consequence of paid work in the present. Mm. Experience, as we've touched on, is a really big one. And that's the one that most new freelancers fall into. We touched on prestige and it'd be good to talk a bit about that. Yeah. Uh, I was chatting to somebody who is 20 years in the industry. Uh, I won't name her name, but you'd know who she was, I think. Mm. She, she uh, is fairly prominent in the industry. And I spoke to her about this topic and we went through the reasons and, and she said two weeks ago she accepted to sit on a panel um, for a very established, well-known fashion brand mm. um, that was going to commercially gain from that content. They, they were selling that content behind a paywall. And it only dawned on her that she was over the moon to get that invitation. Yeah. She saw that as a step up in her career. And so people with big names and Companies that have prestige yeah. can really leverage that mm. to uh, take advantage of, of freelancers. I can definitely see how that would be tempting because then you've got it on your client list that you've worked with this big company. That's it. Yeah. yeah, and as a freelancer you would weigh that up. It may be worth something, but why should that be used to leverage? Why are these big companies who make millions of pounds uh, still penny pinching. This is effectively the foundation of the UK's economy. Yeah. We're not manufacturing or producing en masse. Mm. Uh, a lot of the value, particularly in London, is the creativity and imagination of the people. Yeah. And we are not protecting it. We are giving it away for free. We're undervaluing it. And we're at risk of it becoming a group of wealthy, typically white middle class with rich mum and dads yeah. producing this work. Mm. So this is not just a rant for the creative industry. This has serious knock on effects for lack of diversity in the arts mm -hmm. is very much weighed against anybody who doesn't have financial backing. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who, who lives in London or anywhere in the UK will testify how expensive it is to pay rent. Uh, pay bills and then to be asked to work for nothing mm. and constantly have to fend that off is almost an impossible mission. Mm. You're dipping into a loan or you're asking uh, for help from, from friends or family. Mm. It's not sustainable as a business model and I do think it's going to result in some really sad and, and, and desperate times. Yeah, You touched on internships and I was reading recently that there's been more of a crackdown on, on that in the UK. Do you think more legislation for free work in the freelance world would be a really positive thing? Hugely, mm. yeah. Um, we recently were a part of a round table that um, was having this exact discussion. Mm. Uh, so Freelancer Club and about six or seven other big names in, in the industry uh, and other industries including sport, fashion, TV, music, um, chaired by The Guardian. We pitched in Parliament to mm. an MP to look to change legislation 
Um, we've been looking to New York with this one. There's a fantastic company called Freelancers Union who recently passed a bill to give freelancers more rights. Mm. Uh, some of the things that they managed to change, things like double pay. So if an employer or a client was found not to have paid the freelancer after the terms uh, of the contract, uh, and it went to a small claims court. If they were found guilty, they would have to pay twice the amount that was originally owed. They've also managed to help freelancers cover their legal costs. Mm. Uh, so we want to use a UK version of that template. And we were really fortunate at that round table to have Freelancers Union Skype video into the, into oh. the round table mm. to offer their advice as to how they did it. Unfortunately, Brexit has taken headlines yeah. away from everything else. MPs aren't incredibly keen to jump on this. Mm, yeah. I think they will be once the dust settles. So we're really keen to, to push this and try and change legislation. And in the meantime, we're not waiting around. We're going to be approaching this in a, sort of a, a three-tiered way. Politically, which we've touched on as one, mm. to look to change legislation. Yeah. Approaching companies to ask them to sign a petition and pledge that they won't promote unpaid work. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, it's educating and speaking to freelancers, okay. uh, which, which we've touched on. It's our belief that Tackling these three areas simultaneously uh, will bring about change. Mm. Sounds exciting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Considering my camera turned off, I think, <laughs> that's <a laughs> I think that's a sign that we've talked enough. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you very much for talking with me today. I found that really useful and hopefully my viewers will as well. I will leave links to the Freelancer Club and the No Free Work campaign down below if you want to learn more about it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you again soon. Bye.